Hello and welcome back again to the linear algebra component of the calculus and linear algebra series. Last week we introduced this new topic of set theory and towards the end of the week we talked about this idea of a mathematical structure within mathematics. So let's recall what that was. We said that was kind of a set with some relations on the objects of that set or the elements of that set and then we defined some axioms about those relations. That was a series of propositions that we assumed to be true about those relations. And this week what we want to do is we want to address how would we go about proving particular statements in mathematics given a mathematical structure. So given any particular type of mathematical structure, are there kind of various different ways in which I can construct proofs? And by understanding this, we can apply this to many different areas of maths and we can use these same proof techniques in all sorts of different areas, you know, the linear algebra area, the calculus area, or whatever it might be, group theory or abstract algebra or many other things. So we want to kind of split up the kind of two types of proofs into kind of two classes and the first one we're going to talk about is direct proofs and the second one we're going to talk about is indirect proofs and within those kind of categories we'll talk about some other kind of small cases like proofs by induction or proofs by contradiction and, and we'll kind of go through them about how you actually construct proofs of that type but in this video we're specifically going to look at direct proofs and what it means to prove something directly firstly so to prove something directly, let's suppose that I've been given a mathematical structure and then suppose I'm given a particular statement or proposition within that mathematical structure that I you know, suspect is true and I want to prove that that thing is true. Well, if I want to prove that thing directly, a direct proof is one in which I prove that statement or prove the truth of that statement without actually modifying the statement in any way. So that is I don't modify it and kind of change it into a kind of an equivalent statement using kind of the equivalences that we constructed in propositional logic. I just start with that original statement and I prove its truth only using the axioms of my mathematical structure. So that is a kind of previously assumed truths or any previously proven theorems. So I can use kind of previous, uh, you know, previous theorems that I've proven to be true or propositions. I can use the axioms that I know to be true. And using those truths, I can use kind of some logical deductions to deduce that my kind of new statement is true. And effectively, if I construct that, that is a direct proof. So it's something I construct the proof without modifying the original statement. So let's look at an example of a proof of that type. And the one we're going to look at is going to be of the form something like P implies Q. So this one's a rather simple one, and we've got the sum of two even numbers is even. So as you might suspect, this is a true statement, and we need to prove that it is true. So let's think, well, we're talking here in the context of integers, so we're allowed to use the axioms of the integers that we talked about in last week's uh, video. Um, and also, because it's an if-then statement, how we would go about proving it directly or not modifying it in any way is that we would kind of start with the left-hand side of our implication, assume that that is true, and, and you know show that when that is true, that, that the implication must necessarily be true. So let's construct this in a formal way. So we construct our proof, and the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to write this proposition in kind of using our first order logic, and we want to define what all the different predicates are in this thing. So we've got here that PXY is the predicate, X and Y are even, and QXY is the predicate, X plus Y is even. And we've kind of translated that above into our first order logic symbols. We've got for all x in the integers, for all y in the integers, pxy implies qxy. Now note here that because we've now introduced set theory, we can use this notation for all x in z. Right? So we've now removed this idea of the domain of discourse before we just write for all x, for all y, and then we describe what the domains of discourse now are. In this case, because we've introduced set theory, we want to say that when we're writing for all x in z, that's saying effectively for all x in the domain of discourse z in the integers. So we're going to use this notation from now on because that's the convention that's normally used in mathematics rather than discussing domains of discourse all the time. But notice it was important that we introduced it in that pattern because logic was kind of lying at the bedrock of set theory. We, you need to use logic to prove things in set theory and therefore you know you should really think of this element of as some sort of higher order notion it's you know higher level than logic okay so given that how are we going to prove this statement directly well the first thing we're going to do is we want to assume that this pxy is true so that is we want to assume that there are some values x and y that they're such that they're even right we're going to assume that some values i put into this predicate uh, those are values such that that thing is true. In other words, they're both even. So let's assume 
that x and y are two even numbers. Well, what does that mean? Well, by the definition of even numbers, that means that the two, both of those numbers are divisible by 2. In other words, we can write them as 2 uh, times k and 2 times k prime for some k and k prime in z. Right? That just follows from the definition of even numbers. And now, recall what we're trying to do is we're trying to show for those even numbers that if we add them together, that that is also an even number. So now if we take x plus y, what do we get? So it's going to follow that x plus y is 2 times k plus k prime. And let's think about now going back to our axioms on z. Well, if we take two integers and we add them together, we said that that is also an integer. And that follows effectively by saying that the integers are algebraically closed under addition. As if I take the sum of two integers, that is also an integer. So because k plus k prime is also an integer, it must be that x plus y is even. And that's our proof, right? We've shown that if it's necessarily true that we have uh, x and y are even, that the sum of those two numbers is also even. So that's a direct proof of our statement because we proved it without modifying it any way. All we used is previously defined axioms or theorems or definitions and we just assumed the left-hand side and proved directly that the right-hand side was true in this implication statement. And another example of a direct proof would be something like a corollary, right? A corollary is one, recall, that we said our definition is something that its proof follows directly from a theorem. So this is an example of one where the proof is constructed from a previously proven theorem or proposition. So in this case, we've got this corollary which says every non-empty set of positive integers has a least member. And how would we prove this? Well, recall that we constructed the well-ordering theorem, which said that if I had some subset of the integers and that set is bounded below, then it necessarily has a least member. Well, in this case, we have a subset of the integers, namely the positive integers, and it's clearly bounded below by zero, right? Because it's the posit set of positive integers. Therefore, it follows it has a least member immediately by the well-ordering theorem. So this is an example of a direct proof because I'm kind of proving it. I'm not modifying the statement and I'm proving it directly from a previously verified theorem, from a previously proven theorem. So that's an example again of a direct proof. And the third one I want to consider here is one that just constructs the proof directly from the axioms of our um, of our mathematical structure. So in this case, we've got if x, y, and z are in the integers, then x plus y first plus z is also in the integers. Now, again, this might seem incredibly obvious that if I take the three integers and I add them together, that's also going to be an integer. But this kind of points out an important point within mathematics that no matter how trivial a statement might be, that you should prove its truth if it is not already an axiom. If it's not an axiom, if it's not assumed to be true, and you haven't already proven it, then you have to prove it, right? No matter how trivial it might seem, you have to show that it is true. And in fact, many statements that you might think are entirely trivial are not as trivial as you might think, and you might need to add additional conditions into your axiom or your mathematical structure in order to prove them. So in this case, how are we going to prove it? We're just going to use the closure property of the integers. So recall from the um, last week, we talked about the, what the axioms for z were, so you can find them in the previous week's lecture notes. So it follows from them, that if we take x plus y, uh, or if we take x and y in z, then it follows that x plus y is in z, right? That just follows from this algebraic closure axiom that the sum of two integers is an integer. And now if I just redefine x plus y as t, then it follows that t plus z is in z, where I've defined t to be x plus y, so that's just another iteration of using the closure property. Uh, so in other words, I've proven that x plus y first plus z uh, is also is in z, right, is in the integers. And notice here, importantly as well, it was also an axiom that the sum on the integers was what was known as associative. That was to say that if I do x plus y first and then add z, that's the same as doing x plus y plus z in brackets. So if I did x plus y first and then add z, that's the same as doing y plus z first and then adding x. And that follows from this, again, an axiom that we wrote down about how addition works on the integers, in other words, that it was associative. So it, just to reiterate, this example here is showing directly from the axioms of the integers that this statement is true. I haven't modified the statement in any way, and I've proven it just using the axioms, so it is an example of a direct proof. So that's where we're going to conclude the video, and in the next videos, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some more examples of direct proofs. 
We're going to look at kind of the next one probably is going to be the crudest example of a direct proof, which is a proof by exhaustion. And we'll look at some counter examples as well, which are not really proofs. They're examples in which we can show things are false. And then we'll move on to inductions and then to indirect proofs. So as always, I remind you that the notes are on the Moodle page. You should read these after the video or before the video um, and attempt any problems in the module handbook that are relating to this uh, video. So thanks very much for watching and see you in the next one.